All right. Hey, good morning, Story Fam. How are we doing today? Feeling good? I'm glad y'all are here. If we don't know each other yet, my name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here at The Story. I'm going to be sharing a message here in a moment. But um, first, I just uh, want to say hi to our uh, family joining us online today as well, wherever you are in the world and however you're joining us, whatever platform you're on. Just want to say hi. Be sure to check in in the comments section and let us know that you're here and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to acknowledge you. In that way, our Timber Grove campus that usually tunes in for the message has a live preacher today. Pastor Kale over there is preaching at our Timber Grove campus today, and so don't have to welcome them, but they're in our prayers. Um, before we get to today's message, uh, I just want to offer a couple of uh, a couple of words of encouragement. First of all, the, the prayer um, from our worship team um, today, just about 9-11 and the first responders. Anytime 9-11 comes around, it's always a little bit of a heavy day. Um, but when it comes on a Sunday, it's like it is especially feels like a call to prayer. And so I'm grateful that we're a community that, that is praying for, um, for those who uh, lost their lives that day, but also for their families that can continue to live without them. For our first responders, um, I just want to challenge you before you leave today to offer an extra word of encouragement and thanks to the um, uh, security officers that are here on Sundays. It's a really easy thing to do. Just don't take them for granted. Don't overlook them. When you come across them, just say thank you for being willing to stand in the gap for us and keep us safe and look out for us and our, and our kids and everybody. So that's a good, uh, simple thing we can do on 9-11 uh, Sunday. So um, just want to acknowledge that. Also, um, this is launch season. We are now one week into launching all of our groups and stuff. It's been a crazy, incredible, wonderful week as all of our groups and studies and everything have gotten started. There's one thing I want to call us out on as a church. A church like ours should never be short on um, volunteers with students and young people. We take a covenant at every baptism of every child, every young person, that we as a church are going to raise them to know Jesus and to, to like, like they're our own. And so we have a, a call here. Um, and there's something all of us can do as church members to, to contribute to our student ministries. It's probably the fastest growing area of ministry at the story right now, which is super exciting. Um, but Dylan, our student ministry coordinator, asked me to just offer a plea for help from our congregation. I, I hope we'll have an on, uh, all hands on deck approach. Um, there's a few reasons why I think everyone here should consider volunteering with our student ministries. You got this card when you came in, and this is uh, the easiest way to, to inquire about this, by the way. You can put this in the box on your way out in the offering boxes. You're going to learn more about the Bible by teaching students about the Bible than you will by sitting in these chairs listening to me teach you. I promise you that. So you will grow and be challenged in your faith. The second reason everybody should do this is because it is not a one-size-fits-all thing. Everyone can contribute something. So if you've got one night a month you can give, Dylan and his team will put you to work for one night a month. If you can give three nights a week, Dylan and his team will put you to work for three nights a week. It's, um, it's uh, really up to you there. Um, Dylan asked me to read this part um, verbatim. He wrote this for me, uh, our student ministry coordinator. He said, if you want to serve once every two weeks, great. Once a month, cool. Sunday morning, sick. Sunday night, dope. Wednesday night, righteous. So if you can interpret that, you belong in student ministry, okay? So the third, the third reason is just it is really a lot of fun. It's not just like Sunday school like it was in the old days. There's so many things going on, not least of which is like foundations happening tonight with our students. They get outside and do all kinds of sports and games and stuff. And, um, and in addition to learning and growing in faith, obviously, there's a ski trip coming up later this year. We've never done a student ministry ski trip before. That's coming up. You could get in on that action if you were to volunteer uh, with our student ministry teams. Um, all kinds of other things happening. So just be sure and at least inquire about what's needed on the team and how you might be able to, to uh, support it by uh, submitting that card to us today. All right. So today we're getting into a new series of messages. I am uh, pretty excited uh, James is over. I'm a little bit uh, in grief about that. I really enjoyed uh, teaching through James. But we're starting a new series for the fall. And what this means, because it's a fall series, the summer is over, study guides are back. So you have your study guide. Uh, these are for small groups, but also for individual study. And if you're like me, when I used to go to church and didn't want to really go to church, I use the study guide to figure out how much longer we have till the sermon is over, because you can always track which point I'm on. <laughs> so if that helps you, uh, I understand. It's opening day of NFL and all that today, so you might be thinking about other things. Whatever works for you, that's what we're here for. <laughs> okay, so um, our, our series that we're starting today is called Deep Tracks. 
Deep Tracks is the series. Um, if you're familiar or, or if you're a fan of music, um, you probably know the phrase, Deep Tracks. Deep Tracks are the um, songs on an album that you will never hear unless you're a devoted enough follower of that band to buy the whole album and listen to it all the way through. If you're just a radio fan, you'll only hear the hits. But real fans of a musician or an artist, uh, they know the deep tracks, okay? So my daughter, who's a teenager, is a, is a huge follower, devotee of uh, Taylor Swift, all right? So uh, she will uh, get in the car and insist that every time we're together that we listen and sing along with Taylor together. And um, I'm not all about that game, but I love my daughter, so I get into it. And, and, you know, after all these years of listening to Taylor Swift, I've learned the lyrics or whatever. But my daughter's not just a fan. She doesn't just know the hits. Everybody knows Taylor Swift's hits, right? Blank space. We're never getting back together. I knew you were trouble, mean, like I, everybody knows the hits, but only the real fans, the fans who know every album that Taylor has ever put out and can name. You know, there's the self-titled album, there's Fearless, uh, there's Speak Now, there's Red, there's uh, 1989, there's Reputation, there's, um, I think I have a problem, there's, um, no, there, there's uh, Evermore, there's Folklore, and there's a soon to be released Midnight's, I think. I'm a Swifty, <laughs> now that I think about it, it's just occurring to me. My daughter has converted me, okay. But if you're a, if you're a devotee, you know the deep tracks. You know, you know, Better Man, for example, or you know, some of the ones nobody else knows, you can sing along. Well, the point of this series is to help us all to see that Jesus had some hits. Jesus has some hits, and everybody knows them. Not even, you don't have to be a Christian to like know the hits of Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life, <laughs> right? Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's right, all right? But what about the deep tracks of Jesus? How would you complete the sentence, oh, you, Capernaum, will you go to heaven? <laughs> no, you will burn in hell, Jesus said. <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did you? It's a deep track, Okay. Uh, Jesus had all kinds of, of these deeper tracks. You know, um, uh, what, what did he say about, uh, about swords? Says his disciples, let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy a sword. All right? You didn't know he said that, did you? You've all heard Jesus is all nonviolent. I don't believe in weapons. And he's like, no, go buy a sword, bro. You're going to need it. Like, you didn't see it coming. For the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about the things Jesus said you didn't see coming. Things about uh, issues like, uh, you know, his some seeming infatuation with swords. He said a few things about swords, uh, but also things about, like, end times teaching. Get some deep tracks about the last days. Um, deep tracks about the unforgivable sin, as he called it. Some things we're going to learn that might be new for you throughout this series. And today, well... <laughs> Today's not going to be as much fun as some of the others. I don't think today's deep track teaching of Jesus is what he had to say about divorce. So fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be one of those. And it's just a reminder that if you're following Jesus, you can't just be a fan. Fans can be fair weather. Fans can be casual. If you follow a person, you can't just follow half of them, the half you like. <laughs> you have to follow all of them. And some of this stuff you're going to hear today might not be something you like right away, but if you're following Jesus, you submit yourself to all of his teachings, and you trust him enough to take his word over yours, even on matters like this that are going to strike right at the heart, right close to home for a lot of us. So let's dig right in and see what Jesus had to say about divorce and why it might be surprising. So Matthew chapter 19 is where we're going to be today. You can take the Bible out of the seat back in front of you. Um, you can open your apps if you like uh, to read your Bible that way, or you can um, always follow along on the screen, although I'd rather you uh, have your Bible there. Matthew 19, verse 3. So, here we go. Some Pharisees came to test Jesus. 
They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, the Pharisees asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And there it is. Anyone want to switch places with me today? Anybody feel up to the challenge? This has been my week, figuring out how to deliver this message in all of its glory with both grace and truth. Because this one hits us square between the eyes. Let's get the shocking part out of the way first. Jesus seems to be suggesting that uh, someone who is married and gets divorced for reasons other than sexual infidelity and then remarries someone else is guilty of uh, adultery and is living in the sin of adultery. Now, if this is literally the case, then I know tons and tons of people who are in tons and tons of trouble <laughs> Because this practice he's describing is so, so common in our culture today. Over the past decade, only about a half, a little more than half, of all people who've been surveyed, who've been through a divorce in the last decade, said they got divorced for reasons related to sexual immorality. The most common reason, number one reason by far for divorces in recent years has been just basic incompatibility. So sexual immorality it comes into play in about half of our divorces in our culture today. So is Jesus really saying that those people, millions of people, if you take it historically right, millions of people who got divorced for reasons other than sexual immorality and then remarried somebody else, is he really saying, hey, leave that second marriage you're in, leave them behind, break up that family? Go back to your first spouse, tell them you're sorry, tell them you want them back. And if they won't take you back, then just, you know, I'm sorry about that, but just enjoy growing old alone. Like, like is that really the advice from the Son of God to us about our marriages, our families? Does, does uh, in other words, does two wrongs make a right in this situation? Does, is, does it make sense to break up a second family to try and reconcile the first? What's practically this, the, the teaching here? What is the word for us? today, all right? And it goes deeper, obviously, for us, because if sexual immorality is the only justifiable reason for divorce in God's eyes, what about people who got out of really bad marriages for really good reasons, other than sexual immorality? We all know, probably, I would imagine, we all know someone who got out of a really, genuinely toxic marriage that was unsafe for them, Marriage where um, maybe their ex was uh, abusive or maybe there was an ongoing unchecked addiction that was wreaking havoc on the family and causing real harm. Maybe there was some kind of uh, uh, unchecked sin that was, uh, that was putting people at risk under that roof in that family. What about situations like that, Jesus, we might ask? Then, of course, there's this other category, I think, that. Uh, uh, that is probably the most common, if we're honest. Um, we like to try and talk more about the more extreme cases where someone's life's at risk, uh, abuse and stuff like that, and that's real. And I have never and will never counsel someone who's being abused to stay or go back to an unrepentant spouse where there's just no hope for... I would never offer that advice. I don't think it's biblical for other reasons, but... But, but that's, that, that is, uh, if, you just, if you aren't careful with this teaching, that's what can come across. Now, the majority of situations that you come across in everyday life aren't that. The majority are just, hey, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I, I'm not excited to go home anymore. We're just not in sync. We're not compatible. There's someone else who feels more compatible. They 
They make me feel good about myself like my spouse used to. You hear a lot of that. And it seems to be the status quo that we just sort of um, give a nod to that marriage, to that uh, marriage ending. Like, of course, you're entitled to divorce and be happy. And look, I'm not just criticizing it. I am kind of a little, obviously, but, but I'm not just criticizing. We all love people who have genuinely been happier after an unhappy marriage ended. And that's a really hard argument to make against them when they're sitting across the table in front of you. I'm coming at this like a lot of you are, just trying to seek some truth. And to be challenged, but not to, you know, uh, go overboard, I guess. So where do we draw that line? How do we square what we believe and feel to be true about divorce and marriage today? And how do we square that with, with Jesus' teachings that feel pretty extreme compared to what people are thinking um, today? Let's just dive in and dissect this passage piece by piece, okay? So I want to take the first verse. And we're going to talk about it for a second. The first verse tells us a lot about why Jesus said what he said about divorce. It says some Pharisees, first of all. Some Pharisees came to test Jesus, and then they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? You need to know, you probably know, that Pharisees were Jesus's, uh, I don't know, arch enemy, primary adversary, pebble in his shoe. They just were always around testing him. Did they come asking Jesus about divorce so that they could learn something? <laughs> no. I mean, most, um, most of them knew someone who was divorced. Some of them were divorced. Divorce was more common than you might think in that culture. So were they genuinely seeking some enlightenment, like, maybe I need to check myself? No, they were just testing him. They knew what they believed, and they believed that they were right. They were trying to catch him in something so that they could chip away at his political power, because the Pharisees were all about politics, and they made every issue political in their religious political system that they were lords over in the first century, all right? Now, this is, this is going to really sh shock you, but in the olden days, before we became sophisticated, on hot-button social issues of the day, there were only two ways of looking at it. It was a liberal way and a conservative way. Now, I, for one, am very grateful that we've become enlightened and grown out of it. But, uh, but back then, it was like uh, there were these two views. And the Pharisees were, were fragmented into these two camps. And this is well-documented historical stuff here. There were two schools of thought within Phariseeism in the first century both of which were based on the teachings of a renowned Pharisaical uh, teacher. So the liberal school of thought was called the school of, or the house of, really, Hallel, uh, Hallel who was uh, first century B.C., um, uh, uh, not a rabbi, but an elder. And uh, Hillel was um, a liberal thinker. If you, those words are so pejorative, right? But y'all follow. Be, be graceful with me on this. But, but that was the more co uh, pro progressive side of the debate. Okay, so the house of Hillel had one way of looking at, um, at the Bible, the Hebrew Bible as it was, the Old Testament. And then there was a conservative way of thinking, which was uh, based around and, and adhered to the teachings of a conservative Jewish rabbi who lived at the turn of the century from 50 B.C. to 30 A.D. Interestingly, I think he died the same year as Jesus. And his name was Shammai. Shammai was a, a, an actual rabbi, and, um, and he had a, a great following. Okay, so here's how this broke down. They argued about everything, first of all, all the time. <laughs> um, and the most ridiculous things, even. Like, for example, let me give you an example of what they would sit around and argue about. The Shammai believed it was always, always, always a sin punishable by death or hell or whatever, um, if you told a lie, any lie, all lies are the same. You know, you can lie about something massive or you can lie a little, little, little white lie. And it's all the same. And the example that they used is that if you go to a wedding and the bride on her wedding day passes by and you say you look beautiful today, but she's not very beautiful. <laughs> like, <laughs> the way, I'm afraid to put, even put it the way they did, but they were like, if you tell an ugly bride she's pretty on her wedding day, it's a lie and you're in danger of going to hell. So you should repent. 
<laughs> because every lie is the same. And the Hillel house came along and said, no, no, it's a little, it's a little much there. And we believe that it's okay to tell an ugly bride she's beautiful on her wedding day because this is the biggest, like, bleeding heart liberal, like, uh, uh, line I've ever heard. It's perfect. Because every woman is beautiful on her wedding day. <laughs> like, in some way or another, every bride is beautiful in her own way. All right? So that's how they um, broke down on these arguments. And they would sit around and argue ad nauseum about silly stuff like this. And that's why Jesus was so incredible frustrated by the Pharisees. That's why he always said things to them like this from Matthew 23. It says, you Pharisees travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you've finally succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow the whole camel. That's how Jesus criticized the Pharisees. One of the issues that they fought over most often, these uh, liberal and conservative Pharisees, was divorce. They sat around and argued about who's right and who's wrong for, for hours about divorce. And uh, the passage of Scripture that they would parse out and argue over is in the law of Moses. That's why when they asked him about divorce, they said, is it lawful? They're talking about the law of Moses, and it's from Deuteronomy 24. This is the verse. This is the first part of it. This is the, the, the important part of it for today's purposes. If a man marries a woman, Moses wrote, who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. Keep those two words in mind, something indecent about her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, and then it goes on to explain what comes next. But that's the operative part today, okay? So the Shammai, the conservative house, taught that what's more important in that phrase, something indecent, is the word indecent, and that word indecent is clearly meant to allude to sexual immorality. And so the only way that a man was allowed, permitted, or what the Shammai would say is required, actually, to divorce his wife is if uh, he catches her in adultery. It's not just that he has a license to divorce her, by the way. The Shammai taught that he must divorce her if he catches her in adultery. And no, no other cause is allowed in the house of Shema. But the Hillel came along and were like, we're not so sure about that. And I think, you know, what it reeks of to me is like a bunch of guys that kind of wanted a way out of their marriages because the Hillel came along and they were like, maybe the operative word isn't indecent. Maybe it's something. And maybe something kind of means anything. And if you find your wife doing or whatever, anything indecent, and indecent could mean anything for that matter. It's like blowing up the meanings of words, you know, to, to make it their own uh, political case. When has that ever happened before? It's like, <laughs> uh, but, but you see it happening in, in this instance because the, in the house of Hillel, a man was allowed to divorce his wife. Or again, they also believed if he caught her doing something indecent, it's not just that he was allowed, he was required to divorce his wife if she did things that were indecent, things like not getting along with his mother with her mother-in-law. He had license to divorce her then if he caught her dishonoring his mama. All right? Or um, uh, let's say uh, another example was if she no longer was as beautiful as she used to be and he thought someone else was more beautiful than her. That's a stretch, I, but that's one of the examples that they used. It got worse. If she burned his bread at dinner... Not kidding. If she burned his bread at dinner, that was cause in the house of Hillel to seek a divorce if you're an unhappy husband. So you can see how these Pharisees uh, were just breaking down this issue as though it's political. All right? There's just something else to argue on this horizontal plane, left versus right. But Jesus answered them in a way that made it clear that for Jesus, divorce is not political. Divorce is theological because marriage is theological. That's why he said what he said next in verse 4. He said, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's from Genesis. So he's going back to before the fall of man. He says, in the beginning the Creator made us male and female. 
and that male and female come together to be united, it says. Remember the word cleaved? He will cleave to his wife. Like That's a physical term. It's a, the becoming of one flesh is what happens in the, in the marriage bed. It is the physical union of man and wife that makes, in God's eyes, one flesh, one family, bound for as long as they are alive. And that's why the only um, way to undo what is bound in the flesh is adultery. It is the physical act of sexual immorality because that is how the, the, the marriage bond is forged, is in that act, and it can be unforged only through a perversion of that act. So that's where that uh, comes from. It's not just because, you know, sex, bad, whatever, like you often hear people talk about Christianity and sex and the Bible being anti-sex. That's not it at all. It's actually more pro-sex than the world is. It says the world that, that sex does more than the world would ever say that sex does. It actually binds two people into one flesh in God's eyes, all right? So what's Jesus saying here? Uh, he's saying that, that God made marriage in the beginning, but man created divorce after the fall. And divorce is part of our reality now, but Jesus always wants us to remember how it was in the beginning because the beginning is where we see God's true heart and his intent, his pure intent and purposes for us and for things like marriage. And if God created marriage and did not create divorce and man created divorce and only after the fall, that should tell us something, that marriage and divorce are not things just to be argued horizontally. Jesus wants us to see them vertically. He wants us to see things on earth as God sees them in heaven. Even if we can't make them all that way, all the things that go wrong in this world can't be all made right with our own hands and hearts. But do not forget God's intent lest we become arrogant in our own understanding. Okay. So as far as divorce went, the only thing these two camps, Hillel and Shammai, agreed about was that the Old Testament law about divorce was a command. They both believed that if, uh, if they had cause, then divorce was required. It was a command. And Jesus wanted them to see something else. But first they, they asked him, why then? If it is as you say, Jesus, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? If you've got your study guides, you can just look back up to Deuteronomy 24, and I, I would love for you to find for me somewhere where it says, Moses said, it's a command. <laughs> but they had interpreted it that way through the sort of fallen convenience of their own lens, right? They made it a command because it behooved them to benefited them in their sinful fallenness, all right? Now, Moses said, it's a command. Jesus replied, check it out, Moses permitted you, which is a very different word than commanded you, right? Moses didn't command you. He permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, because you were fallen, because you were sinful. You were a mess, chaotic. You were, you were a disaster, so Moses permitted this. But it was not that way from the beginning. Again, an allusion to God's created intent. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Okay. So the Pharisees assumed and preached that divorce was a command. If it is a command, then the assumption is it is a command from God. Therefore, it is in some way or another a good if it is a command from God, it must be a good. But Jesus taught marriage that divorce is um, not a command, but a concession. It's very important that we understand the difference between a command and a concession. God frequently offers concessions to his people, especially when things have gone horribly, horribly wrong in the world. When people have just gone buck wild and everything's chaotic and everyone's missing the mark, God comes along and goes, what have you guys been doing? And he just offers a concession like any good father would. Every parent here, every father especially, but every parent knows what it's like. When you have um, a father's heart in you, a parent's heart, let's say, and you have a child who is imperfect and fallen, and sometimes your child acts like the very embodiment of original sin. 
And there is nothing, seemingly nothing you can do about it, but there are moments where you just make the best out of a really fallen, awful situation. Like, I, I hear a lot of new parents, when they just have a baby, saying, I see all these parents raising their kids with screens and social media, and I will never be like that with my child. And, and every other parent goes, okay, just wait. Just wait till that first flight. Just wait. Uh, just wait till that long car ride. Just wait till that quiet restaurant is completely interrupted and, and drawn to a standstill by the shrieks of your petulant child. Just wait. Just wait until you finally feel compelled to give your child a concession because of what a fallen nightmare they've become, and you give them the screen, the phone, the iPad, whatever, just to get through a moment, just to keep them somehow in orbit, all right? And then immediately the power dynamic changes in your whole life. You might not even know it. But the next time that child wants that screen, they are smart enough to know that they are now in control. And if they ask you for it and you say, no, I'm not that kind of parent, what do they have to do? What choice do they have, they might say, <laughs> but to throw another fit until you break and you will break. <sighs> And then what began as a concession becomes a command. And interestingly enough, it's not just your command. Eventually, it's theirs. And so it is with divorce. And that's the point Jesus is making. It began as a concession given to, by a perfect God to an imperfect, fallen, broken people. And over time, it has increasingly become something we understand uh, as a command. We should be entitled to divorce on demand. Just think about how we think about this and talk about it. And again, just keeping in the forefront of our minds the sensibilities, sensitivities of this issue. I, I just, I, I think we have to be honest about our understanding of divorce as more of a command than a concession anymore. And that's just human nature, right? But to remember that divorce is a concession is to acknowledge, at minimum, that divorce is always tragic. Divorce is always disastrous. Divorce is always the result of sin. Now, the act of divorce is not always a sin itself. In certain situations, according to Jesus, the act of divorce is sort of uh, uh, understood, necessary sort of uh, remedy. But in most most situations, you could say that divorce itself is a sin. In all situations, you could say divorce is the result of sin. And that's why it's important to remember that divorce was offered by God as a concession and not a command. If it were a command, it would have been part of his original intent and design, and it was not. Now, it's Popular to think of Jesus as a little more lenient than Old Testament Father God, right? It's like a little, he's the softy of the Holy Trinity. Like Jesus is supposed to just give us a hug and tell us everything's going to be okay. And here he is with more extreme ideas about divorce than the Hillel and Shammai put together. It's funny to me how it ends, this, this little uh, story in Scripture ends with the next verse. We didn't even read the first time through, but the, the disciples hear what Jesus said, and they respond in the most hilarious way possible. These are all young guys, all right? And this is their response in Matthew 19, 10. The disciples said to Jesus, yo, if this is the situation, <laughs> if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better just not to get married, Am I right? Like, that's the vibe? Like, they're all, like, teenage guys or 20-something guys. Like, maybe we should just stay out of that whole game. And uh, you can see how they could come to that conclusion. I love those disciples. They remind me of us sometimes. Um, who can argue with that? Uh, there's three things I want to say real quick before we close. Real quick, I promise. These aren't three other points. They're just three little short things. First is that I know and you know, and most importantly, God knows that none of us can change the past. And I hope that's good news for you. I hope that's comforting to you because it's true. You cannot change what has already happened. You cannot change the past. It's, it's truly water under the bridge, not just for you, but from God's perspective too. And I don't believe that God 
expects you to go and make every little thing right that's ever gone wrong in your life. I think the moment God finds you and confronts you with his truth, he says, let's go forward together. And so if he's confronting you with his truth today, let him take you forward. And don't let the the enemy tempt you to look back because that will only bring on more shame, more guilt, everything else. You can't change the past, but you can confess the past that needs to be confessed. Not to me, not to a priest, to God. You can repent of the past, the parts of your past that need repenting. You can insist on not repeating the past. You can raise your children and your children's children in ways that prevent them from repeating the mistakes of you and your family's past. But only by being honest, only by being real with God about mistakes and misgivings and sin. You can't change the past, but by grace, by God's grace, he can help you correct it. Second, if you're married, And uh, if you're happy in your marriage and there's no problems, I congratulate you and I invite you to, to teach the re-engage class uh, starting this fall. Because I don't know anybody like that. People who have never experienced a lasting marriage uh, are often tempted to think that the people who, who are in lasting marriages are just the ones that were lucky enough to find their soulmate. <laughs> Give me a break. Like that is not, <laughs> that is just, it's <laughs> not how it works. Look, sticking it out in marriage is noble, it's heroic. It's not always what you feel like doing, I know, but sticking it out is to stake a claim for future generations that it is better to stay and build, even when you don't feel like it, than it is to pull away and maybe destroy in the wake. There is no doubt that divorce is harmful, especially for children. The statistics are what they are. I don't want to beat anyone over the head with them. But if you're in a marriage, even if you're barely holding on, fight with everything you've got and let divorce not even enter the conversation. May it be the last of last resorts. And uh, may you give it every effort to fight and restore your bond. Your church is here for you, by the way, uh, if you need help in that fight. Third, I would offer this, and this is another deep track of the Bible that most people don't know. God knows the pain of divorce. If you have been through or are going through that pain of divorce, I want you to know that God knows that pain. Did you know God has been through an actual divorce? This is from Scripture itself, Jeremiah 3, verses 8 to 14. For all of her adulteries, I gave, this is his spouse, his wife in this instance, like, I gave the faithless Israel a certificate of divorce. I gave her what she wanted. She wanted out. I gave her a divorce, and she left. Return now, faithful Israel, he said. I I will not frown on you any longer, for I am faithful even though you weren't, even though maybe you're not now. I am faithful. I won't be angry forever. Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband and I will choose you. Tell me there's no romance in the Bible. I will choose you when you don't choose me. I will be faithful when you are faithless. Y'all, God created marriage in the beginning. Man created divorce after the fall. The good news is that in the hereafter, in eternity, in heaven's kingdom come, divorce will be no more. Divorce will no longer exist, but marriage will. Maybe not our marriages, but one marriage will exist, the marriage of Christ and his people, the church, even though we've been faithless and imperfect, fallen and and fragmented and fractured in our hearts. He will choose us, restore us, and reclaim us as his bride and welcome us home again. No matter what you've gone through in this life, I think that's hope for all of us in the next. Would you pray with me? God, um, we thank you for this uh, reminder today, for this teaching about this difficult topic that touches all of us in some personal way, Lord. This is not easy. Lord, I pray for the brokenhearted I pray for those for whom this message was especially difficult, and I pray for their patience with me as 
pastor and preacher and their um, understanding of you as a loving father. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hard hearts and reconcile what's broken. Help us to be humble in our seeking of your truth and in our marriages and our relationships. Help us to love as you love. And we pray together in Jesus' name, amen.